Good morning, I'm Dr. Joe Matthew and today we are going to be talking about the selection of artificial teeth. In a previous video, you would have seen the selection of artificial teeth for anterior teeth selection. Today we are going to focus primarily on posterior teeth selection. Remember that these artificial teeth with, that we select is going to be primarily of use in removable prosthodontics, whether it's removable partials or whether it's complete dentures, because that is where you're going to select artificial teeth that are already prefabricated. When it comes to fixed partial dentures, we are custom fabricating it. There are also some of the elements and the uh, ideas of uh, anterior teeth selection come into play, but primarily uh, you're going to be following the anatomy of the tooth that is adjacent to it. So that's a little different in the selection or the idea of how to create it. Here we are going to be primarily talking about the selection of artificial teeth, that means teeth that are already made available to us, and this is primarily used in removable prosthodontics. So let's jump in. As I told you before, this is taken from different textbooks, so do verify the textbooks in your syllabus and make notes with regard and respect to what you need to learn. Okay, but let me give you a broad overview as to how to select posterior teeth forms. Okay, posterior teeth selection. So, what are the things that are going to be involved in the posterior teeth selection? Number one, the size. What are the size of the posterior teeth that you're going to select? Number two, the number of teeth you want to select. Okay, how many teeth are you going to place? Now, how are you going to figure that out? Third, the form of the teeth. Okay, so these are the three factors that you're going to primarily deal with. And I'm going to be dealing with this at an undergraduate level. So, uh, bear in mind, when it comes to a postgraduate level, there are some modifications that you can make, especially with regard to the mesiodistal width, that is the number of teeth that you can place. Okay, so here we are just going to look at the basics and the size, the number and the form is what we need to be thinking about when we talk about posterior teeth selection. Number one, the size. So in the size, obviously you know there is a buccolingual width. And what is this buccolingual width? The buccolingual width is the width of the tooth from the lingual to the buccal or the buccal to the lingual if it's on the side. So that width of the occlusal table is going to be important to provide adequate mastication. Okay, so you need to have an adequate size to provide mastication. This is very important. Number two, it should support the cheek and the tongue. This is very important. If it doesn't support, you're going to have a in appearance of the cheek and it's not going to look like the patient is having any teeth. Number three, it needs to function in harmony with the rest of the tissues. It cannot impinge or constrict or constrain any of the tissues that are there. Okay? It need, you need to be able to, he needs to be able to function speaking, uh, swallowing, chewing. It needs to happen. And this is primarily happening with the posterior teeth. So that's important there. Okay. The third, the fourth thing. It should always be less than the width of the natural teeth. Remember that the natural teeth are really wide and the artificial teeth that you have, if you're going to make it that wide, you're going to have problems in the stability of the denture. The stability of your natural teeth depend upon the roots that are embedded in the bone. So because of the difference in the mechanism of how the dentures are supported, you okay, know, implant, uh, implant complete dentures or implant supported teeth take their support from the bone. So that's a little different. Possibly you can have a larger occlusal table. But here in removable prosthodontics, most of the time you are having a denture base which is sitting on slippery, wet mucosal ridges. So the base can always shift. And this lack of stability is what you want to address when you are choosing the width of the tooth. So unless you choose a size that is slightly narrower, the wider the tooth becomes, the more tipping and talking forces that starts happening on a single side of the ridge. So it should always be less than the width of the natural teeth, but not too small because you need to have adequate size for a table for mastication. Remember that. Okay. So it should not be, and it also needs to be big enough to support the cheek as well as uh, the tissues in that region of the mouth. So that's very important. Okay, the other one is it should not be so large as to encroach upon the tongue space or the buccal corridor. So if the tooth is too large, like I told you before, it's going to encroach upon the buccal corridor if it, or if it's too large, it's going to encroach upon the tongue space, making the tongue constrained. This will create a problem as in the patient is going to try to adjust, the tongue is going to 
constantly push against it causing destabilizing the denture so this instability is going to increase if the teeth are too wide or even if they are positioned far too much lingually the tongue is going to try to push it up far too much buccally the cheek are going to put but the cheek is a bit more passive force not very active in pushing so if i were to suggest i would say be very careful not to have too wide a table or to place it too lingually because that's going to create a big problem as compared to even if it's slightly buckle all right okay uh, the other one is artificial teeth being narrow buccolingually helps to produce or help to develop a proper denture slope this proper denture slope really helps in adding stability to the denture so here the question is do i place the tooth where the natural teeth were that is the most ideal right or do i place it buccally or do i place it lingually if i place it buccally i'm going to interfere with the buccal corridor if i place it lingually i'm going to interfere with the tongue space so i need to try to assess where the teeth were last uh, the other video that i spoke about the other day i told you that it's a good idea to understand how the ridges resolve that way we have an understanding as to where the natural teeth would probably have been and you want to mimic that position because that is the position where you will find stability when the dentures i'm sorry when the ridges resolve over time okay many factors maybe there's extraction uh, consequences maybe there's accident maybe there's trauma whatever it is the ridges tend to resolve and it may resolve differently and may not look like where what it used to be so the teeth positions may look different if you look at it just without considering the pattern of resorption so remember to consider the pattern of resorption the maxilla vertical as well as towards the medial mandible vertical the anterior towards the lingual and the posterior towards laterally so if you remember this and try to make your occlusal rim looking at those parameters then more or less you will be able to verify this position in the patient's mouth and you will be able to place the teeth where the natural teeth where that is where the neutral zone is going to be between the tongue and the cheek the safe space where you can actually load it okay continuing with the buccolingual width there can be some modifications if the ridge is well formed and strong covered with good attached mucosa then the entire buccolingual space you can use so that means you can have a larger buccolingual tooth that means larger table for mastication that means more masticatory efficiency okay so this can be done okay because the ridge has the ability to tolerate this sort of a heavy force on the other hand if the ridge is weak and resorbed and covered with thin mucosa then the size must be smaller because the ridge can't take up the load the wider the tooth is going to become the more lateral forces are going to come in the more unstable it's going to get and the mastication is going to uh, really cause more and more resorption and more instability into the denture so in a narrow weak ridge that's having a thin lining prefer a buccolingual width that is less in a well formed ridge you can prefer a buccolingual width that is slightly more so this is another interesting observation so i told you proper size and positioning of the teeth will help improve denture stability because this contour developing the proper contour of the tooth of the denture also is helped by the proper size of the teeth and this being the tongue space and this being the cheek space is in the neutral zone and you know it just blends in perfectly with the tissues in the mouth okay so it aids in the stability of the denture this is very important to remember all right the other aspect of size is the occlusal gingival height what sort of height can be placed now it's going to be determined by the available inter ridge space obviously if you have a resorbed ridges and the inter ridge space is very high obviously you will have to take teeth that have greater occlusal gingival height the rest of the height is going to be built up by the denture base right so you're going to have denture base and you're going to have teeth that are going to meet uh, each other in occlusion and the highest uh, width is what you're going to take right highest occlusal gingival height the teeth with the largest possible vertical length that can be used without grinding is preferred so because you know and i know that grinding is a tedious process right so when you start grinding in the lab you will spend a lot of time grinding 
if you select too big a tooth and you need to grind every, you know, the, the end that comes towards the wax, if you're going to grind every tooth on that end, it's going to be tedious. So select a size, an occlusal gingival height that has enough height and that can be easily placed into your occlusal limbs to meet. Okay, that's the height you want to take. So don't choose too large teeth in too small ridges and then keep trimming and wasting your time. Select your occlusal gingival height appropriately. So this is the interridge space. You want to select something like that. So you have enough of a denture space there and denture based material space. And that is how you want to carry it. If the, if the space is small, you'll obviously have to take larger teeth. If the space is less, you're going to have to take smaller teeth. If you take this teeth and put it here, what is going to happen is that you will have to trim all the cervical and the other areas of these teeth. So you're going to spend a lot of time trimming these teeth, okay, instead of being able to arrange it easily. So that's what I want you to remember because you, you're going to waste a lot of time in the lab trimming and trimming. So choose the right size. It helps make the work easy and less tedious to you. Okay, next is the number. How many teeth do you want to set or how do you decide that? That is the mesiodistal width. So, if you are going to measure the from the distal of the mandibular cuspids to the beginning of the ascending area of the mandible, then you know what is the distance available to you. Now, remember that you would never place any teeth on the ascending area of the mandible. Okay, that is inclined. If you place teeth there, you are going to direct forces uh, onto an inclined plane, and that's not going to be vertical. This incline is going to cause the lower denture to slide forward. And that's going to create pain in the lower anterior lingual area so you don't want to do those things you want to keep it more or less on the flat part of the occlusal rim okay or the flat part of the ridge so identify from the maxillary mandibular cuspid till where the mandible starts to rise the ascending area identify that space that is the area you want to place your posterior teeth having that width Okay, or that mesiodistal width, you are going to then look for a posterior teeth set that comes within that range. And that is the teeth set that you are going to select for arranging your posteriors. Based on that, you are going to take a corresponding maxillary set. Okay? Posterior teeth, as you know, should never be placed on the retromolar pad area. It is soft, easily displaceable, and it usually causes some tipping of the denture during masseries. So, all those from ascending uh, area of the mandible, you are not placing, and obviously the retromolar pad comes behind it. So you are not placing anything all over there. It's just a denture base that's going to cover there. No teeth in that region. Okay. So you're going to select from the cuspid to the ascending area, and you're going to find that that mesiodistal width. And this mesiodistal width, you're going to use. Go to your shade chart, or your tooth chart, and select the posterior teeth form that fits that range. Once you select it, arrange it. That means you minimize the mesiodistal grinding. Sometimes I'm sure you would have seen you have some mesiodistal grinding to do and you can minimize that. Okay. And you can take a corresponding maxillary set that will give you good occlusion. So this is the cuspid to the ascending area, right? So that's where the ascending area starts. And that's probably where you want to stop. You don't want to go over to the ascending area or to the retromolar pad. So continuing with, you want to always place the mandibular teeth as far posteriorly as possible. What do I mean by that? Well, you can think, okay, uh, I've been advised not to place it on the ascending area of the mandible. So let me take really a shorter set. You now taking a, the shortest set possible just solves the issue. Why do I even have to measure? Well, the reason is this. If you place it, take the shortest set, you are actually taking the occlusion and the load of occlusion, load of mastication way into the anterior segment of the mandible and there the bone is weaker now this is going to create more load on that segment more resorption more problems so you want to keep the occlusion the posterior occlusion as posterior as possible so that is the idea so take it as posterior as possible use that entire segment so there's a lot of distribution of force and you want to take it more posteriorly so there's larger bone that can support it don't push it to the anterior segment Okay. Third one, of course, there is modifications in for this measurement in class two and class three arches. So obviously, in class two arches, the mandible is going to be receded. When the mandible is receding backwards, 
and you have a convex profile, you're going to have less space for, from the cuspid to the ascending area. That means that you will not be able to place all the teeth or you will have to take a very small set as compared to the maxillary. That may create a problem. So you need to come to a compromise between how, what is the width of teeth that you're going to select and what is the width of teeth you're going to select in the maxillary. So either you take a smaller set that can work well with the proper anterior smi maxillary smile and occlusion, adequate occlusion. Either you go there, okay, it's like a compromise there, or you take a larger set, a normal set that is correct for his mouth, for the patient's mouth, and then you remove the premolars of the mandible in a class 2 situation, okay, either the first or second, depending on what suits your uh, mesiodistal width accurately, and or you can even grind it sometimes, thereby bringing down the width of the mandibular segment because the mandible is receded. You, I hope you follow me. The mandible is receded, so there's less space here. So you decide either to go with this space, then maybe the select corresponding set in the maxilla may be too small. If it is too small, it may be a problem in aesthetics and other functions. So one of the things you can do is take a correct size and then reduce one premolar off, okay? Or you may have to grind it to get the occlusion right. So this is how you would modify it in a class two. In a class 3, the mandible is prognathic. There, again, you have more space in the mandible than you have in the maxilla. So you place all the teeth in the maxilla, mandible and you may find that the maxilla can't have a corresponding occlusion. So then again, you decide whether you're going to take a slightly smaller size so that both of them fit or you're going to take, you're going to give some spacing or, you know, rearrange that so that the man, maxilla and mandible can come into a proper occlusion. So these modifications will need to happen. The third thing we are going to talk about is form. Now this is the one that we are all very familiar with. We know and we have heard so much about posterior teeth forms. So this aspect is easy to choose because we know what it is. But remember, we need to choose this depending upon the patient's rich form as well as the occlusal scheme you are planning. So if you are planning to give a balanced occlusion, Centric occlusion, neutrocentric occlusion, lingualized occlusion, okay, all of this is going to have some effect on the sort of tooth form that you are going to select. All right, so that's something that you must remember. Now, also, what sort of ridge the patient has. If the patient has different forms of ridge, then that is going to dictate what sort of occlusal form or what sort of posterior occlusal form you are going to select. Now, the other things that will matter into this is neuromuscular control and muscle tone. Sometimes, when you do jaw ablation, you might have noticed that the patient bites at one time in one location. Sometimes he bites forward, sometimes he bites to the side. You see this happening all the time. So, the patient is unable to come to a position. But you might notice that when you've set the teeth, the patient is consistently coming to a place and by the time you realize that your jaw relation went wrong, most of the time it happens, all right? That's okay. Now, the point I'm trying to make is the reason the patient is able to come to a bite in the trying stage is because at the trial, with the trial benches on, there are teeth and he's able to bring it to a specific lock position, okay? Now, that position may be in centric or may not be in centric. If it's not in centric, you need to correct it so that it does get into centric position. That's the difference. Now, if the patient is unable to still, when the trial dentures are placed with the teeth and the patient is unable to still bite into the same or into the correct location and he's giving you shifted bites, then that means you can suspect that there may be some neuromuscular control issues. Also, if the patient is very weak, very poor muscle tone, then you may not want to give, you know, tooth forms that are very, um, having very high cusps. So you may want to consider that. So those are two considerations based upon the patient's neuromuscular and muscle tone that you're going to consider when it comes to occlusal tooth form or the tooth form, posterior tooth form. Now, as far as ridges are concerned, when you have well-rounded ridges, you are going to use teeth that are very prominent cusps. When you have low-rounded ridges, the prominence of the cusps need to come down. And when you have flat ridges, obviously you need to have an occlusal form or a scheme that's very really more flat. Why? Because otherwise, the lateral stability of the denture gets affected. So if you have a good well-rounded ridge, the lateral stability is going to be much better 
and the patient can afford to have prominent cusps. Is that a better idea? Yes, obviously, because we have more prominent the cusp, the better the masticatory efficiency. So the less prominent the cusp, you're going to come to a place where there's some instability, less efficiency, but then in a lower rounded ridge, that's what you want to go for. When it's coming to flat ridges, obviously if you're going to give cusp tooth, the patient is going to keep rocking the denture all over the place when she's trying, he or she is trying to chew. So what are the three forms that we have? The three forms that we have are anatomic teeth, semi-anatomic teeth and non-anatomic teeth. Anatomic teeth, semi-anatomic teeth, non-anatomic teeth. This is how they basically look like. So what are anatomic teeth? Basically they are teeth with good prominent cusps, similar to the occlusal surface of natural teeth, available in various degrees of inclination, the standard usually being about 33 degrees approximately. Okay, So that is the scheme. So if you take the flat, if you take a flat cross section as 0, 33 degrees up is going to be the cusp height. That is at the anatomic form of posterior teeth. That's what most of us use and most of the time have. Okay, So we are going to vary it when we see patients that are requiring other ones. So this is how you usually see it in the clinics. Semi-anatomic teeth. Well, they are similar to cusp teeth, but they don't have as prominent cusps. Okay, So the occlusal anatomy is less prominent uh, compared to the natural teeth and the cuspal heights or inclinations are approximately about 15 to 20 degrees, not all the way up to 33 degrees. Okay, so that's semi-anatomic, can be used in various uh, occlusal schemes and they pose less challenge to denture stability than the other one. But remember, they also have less masticatory efficiency. So this is good in a situation where you have low well-rounded ridges. So what are the advantage of anatomic and semi-anatomic teeth? Well, because the cusps are present, they make contact in the centric fossa and centriculation. That means the patient is provided with a comfortable position okay, and a point of return. So the patient can always bite and come back and the patient finds this precise locking mechanism very helpful to chew it because the patient can remember this position and come back to this position, you know, locking in accurately. Two, the contours are more compatible with the surrounding oral environment. So that's uh, interesting as well. It will give you that proper sluice ways, the proper channels for food moving, all those things, support, all those things are uh, comfortable and in harmony. So the patient smiles also. You, you see the cusp teeth looks much more natural than any other teeth. The occlusion is more organized and has depth avoiding sudden closure. So sometimes when the patient is biting, because he has cusps, the patient can actually feel and come into the closure. This helps avoiding a sudden bite, and that is usually like what we see in flat occlusals. The sudden bite creates sudden force that the patient was not expecting because he is not he didn't know where to close his teeth. So this is more an organized occlusion when you have anatomic or semi-anatomic teeth. And you can always use these teeth for balance occlusion. I told you the occlusal scheme is important. Now you cannot use uh, flat occlusal schemes for balance occlusion because you can get balance only in one or two parameters, the other ones you will not be able to get any balance. So for balance occlusion you prefer an anatomic or a semi-anatomic teeth. So the disadvantages of using anatomic and semi-anatomic teeth. Okay, so first of all the presence of cusps produces more horizontal forces during mastication. This means there is lack of stability. Second, the harmonious balance occlusion that you developed may be lost during settling. Once the denture settles, you might lose that. So that's a problem. Third thing, the base will require frequent relining. Why? Because there is an occlusion that is heavy, that is strong, and the patient is chewing on it. There will be some resorption happening over time. Normally there is resorption, but again with cuff teeth, there will be a bit more resorption than normal. So, or there may be resorption anyway, but you will need to reline the dentures so that the dentures are always stable and the occlusal, stable is pro occlusal scheme is providing the stability that you planned it to give and remaining in the balance that you want it to have. So for this reason, these are the three disadvantages. More horizontal forces, you may lose your balance when settling occurs, 
And the third one, you have to do treatment realigning, otherwise you will not retain the occlusal stability and the balance that you had. Okay, what about non-anatomic teeth? Well, non-anatomic teeth look like this. I told you the posteriors will look a little off if you see it, if you are noticing it. Otherwise, it's not really much of a problem, but this is how the posteriors look in occlusion. No cusps are there as you can see, and therefore, when the patient grinds horizontally or lateral grinding, lateral movements, patient is not going to have any interference. This is advantageous to retain stability in the denture, but the efficiency may be compromised. So this is what we need to remember in this. So non-anatomic teeth are basically cusless teeth, or rather you can say monoplane teeth, or zero degree posteriors. So the flat occlusal scheme, it really helps, uh, you know, to reduce the forces that are talking on the denture base. Now, this is a degree of zero degree inclination, so it's just flat, okay? The advantage is less damaging than cusp teeth, uh, especially when the teeth are not arranged in balance occlusion. So if you are using flat posteriors, maybe it's a better idea not to think about balance occlusion too much. So if you're not arranging it in balance occlusion, this is much more advantageous, okay? Less damaging. Third one, and the second point, they offer less resistance to horizontal forces, so less damage to ridge. So the patient, if the patient has underlying conditions like bruxism or porous ridges, malgulated jaws like in, cl in class 1, class 2 or class 3, then all this comes helpful. Uncoordinated neuromuscular control, I told you before, in all these cases, maybe it's an advantage to place zero degree posteriors. This is how the zero degree posteriors look like schematically, right? The disadvantages, they occlude only in two dimensions, right? Because of this, there's an absence of the vertical component in the cusps that reduces the shearing efficiency. What tears your food? The, the food borders is there, the cusp is actually going to go in and the cusp from the other side is going to go in and it's going to help tear it. Now that component, that vertical component of the cusp is not there. So the shearing of food is really going to be difficult. It's going to look, feel like you're actually hitting the food with a hammer between two pieces of a brick or, you know, something just hitting, hitting, flattening it down rather than tearing it apart. So that efficiency really falls. The third, the second thing is that the occlusal grinding further impairs efficiency, okay? So this sort of grinding is also minimized or efficiency is minimized in this sort of grinding. Poor aesthetics, posterior teeth, if the patient has a big smile showing some of his posteriors, aesthetics is not that great. Third, the last point, obtaining lateral and protrusive balance is next to impossible, okay? So you can't get lateral balance. You can get lateral movement, but lateral balance is not possible and protrusive balance is not possible. So these are the features that are not going to happen in non-anatomic teeth. For this reason, I told you, it's a good idea to place non-anatomic teeth when you're not planning a balanced occlusion scheme. So, what are the teeth material that you're going to select? Now, previously, porcelain was the material of choice. Obviously, over the last decade or so, new generation acrylic resins have really improved their wear resistance, their color characteristics, they have many, many layers coming in now, and it's having good translucency, and, you know, it's really lifelike. So, the advantages are very different from porcelain and so uh, it is dominated the market and it's ever increasing in popularity. I personally I don't know many people who use porcelain denture teeth anymore okay because it's, it's so much more easier to use good quality acrylic resin okay. So the deep material can be resin usually monolithic cross-linked or IPN linked right and the most common one is the cross-linked and the IPN linked because they are much more stronger and they offer greater wear resistance and so the patient can use the dentures over a longer period of time without losing the vertical dimension because of wear, okay? And of course you also have composite teeth, not very popular, and you have porcelain teeth. So in resins you have acrylic and composite, in um, the other one is porcelain. So we're going to talk basically the difference between porcelain and acrylic teeth because that is a two main art sources of artificial teeth that are available in the market and definitely acrylic teeth way more popular than porcelain teeth as of today. So what are the different things? One, uh, the property, then talk about the acrylic resin, talk about the porcelain resin. First property is 
the bond with the resin denture base okay obviously acrylic is resin so denture base is resin both of them will bond chemically so that's a big advantage their bonding is very strong doesn't usually come off unless you've accidentally created some sort of barrier that does not allow the bonding to happen so that means it's important when you are after your de-waxing make sure that the tooth surfaces the tooth surfaces in the after de-waxing in the mold clean them up really nicely right and make sure there is no wax or film of anything left so that the acrylic can actually bond well with the acrylic teeth positive teeth obviously using mechanical pins and holes so this is a mechanical interlocking it's not going to be as strong as the chemical one so this is the difference between the two then the next problem property is the solubility in oral fluids and the dimensional change now both of these uh, teeth artificial teeth are insoluble and they really don't show much of dimension changes the acrylic teeth very minimal dimension change the porcelain teeth almost zero dimension changes in oral fluids so here i have pictures of porcelain denture teeth and acrylic denture teeth so the basic difference between the two is that the porcelain denture teeth have got mechanical retention elements in the ridge slab surface of the teeth when compared to the acrylic denture teeth. The acrylic denture teeth on the ridge slab surface is flat, is smooth. There is no retention elements because the acrylic denture teeth primarily bonds with the denture base resin chemically. So they don't need any retention elements. Whereas the porcelain denture teeth do not bond with the denture base resin chemically so obviously you need some retention elements. So I've just given you two pictures here of the porcelain denture teeth anteriors as well as posteriors, the ridge lap surface so that you can identify the differences in the two. This is important because sometimes in the YOOC they place these teeth and ask you to identify which one they are and if you haven't seen them that becomes a problem. So here on the ridge lap surface of the porcelain denture teeth, the anterior teeth, you will find that there are two metallic pins protruding out backwards. They are usually metallic, usually I see that they are gold plated, sometimes even silver plated, but golden color metallic pins are very common. Whatever it is, there will be metal pins in the back of the anterior teeth and protruding out. This helps in the mechanical retention of the porcelain anterior teeth. In the posterior teeth, you find that there is a huge hole in the ridge lap surface which is called a diatoric hole. And then you have two small holes on either side, mesial and distal, two small holes that are called vent holes, into which actually into the diatoric hole the acrylic denture base resin goes in and the excess flows out through the vent holes, giving it the mechanical retention it needs to hold in place. This is important because sometimes you get an MCQ question that says diatoric holes are seen in and you wonder where, what is this diatoric hole? Well, diatoric holes are seen in porcelain denture teeth, especially porcelain denture posterior teeth, which helps in the mechanical retention of the porcelain denture posteriors to the denture base resin. I hope that is clear. The primary difference between porcelain denture teeth and the acrylic denture teeth. Okay. So here in the posterior ridge lap area, there is a diatoric hole, there is a vent hole, there in the anterior there is a pin. Okay. When it comes to the uh, acrylic denture teeth, it's a very smooth surface. Just the two differences. The third property is the mechanical property. Obviously, the acrylic resin is less brittle. It's got high resiliency and toughness. So the acrylic teeth don't tend to break or chip. They are less brittle and they have good resistance, good resilience. So that means it can take the flexural loading. That's very good. When it comes to porcelain teeth, they're very brittle. So they can chip and fracture fast. When it comes to maintenance of vertical dimension of occlusion, there's poor abrasion resistance as compared to porcelain teeth. Now the newer materials are much more better. So you do have much better abrasion resistance in the newer materials of acrylic resin. But the porcelain resin was excellent in its abrasion resistance. So this is one thing that maintains the vertical dimension of occlusion. There is a lopsided to it when it comes to removal partial dentures. Okay, That is the effect on opposing occlusion. The acrylic resin can oppose natural teeth or metal occlusal surfaces without any problem and they will go for a long time. But when it comes to porcelain teeth, if the opposing natural teeth really abrades because porcelain is hard and it's very quite abrasive to the natural enamel. 
It can also abrade any metallic surfaces like restorations, things like that. So that is a problem when it comes to porcelainty. Okay, the tooth contouring and occlusal adjustments and repolishing. When you do dentures, you know that you have to do some recontouring after the processing because there will be some processing errors. You're going to do some fine adjustments. You're going to do some polishing, all those things. Every time after denture uh, processing, there will be some adjustments that you need to make in the patient's mouth. Now, that is going to be relatively easy if you use acrylic teeth. Porcelain teeth, you can do it. There are burrs that will help you do the porcelain grinding and finishing, but they may result in loss of the surface glaze meaning that the surface may become much more rougher. That means the opposing teeth is going to abrade much faster if it's a natural teeth. So these are things that you need to consider when it comes to porcelain teeth. Okay? Grinding of ridge lap areas. You know the part of the tooth that goes on to the denture base, that's called the ridge lap area of the tooth. That area is easy to grind, especially if the teeth are too high, too high. occlusal gingivity too high. You're going to have to grind the ridge lap areas. So the ridge lap area grinding is much more easier than the porcelain when it comes. And when you grind the porcelain in the ridge lap area, you're going to end up losing the pins on the anteriors. You're going to end up reducing the height of the depth of the diatoric hole. That means there's going to be a compromise in the tooth resin bond in porcelains. Aesthetics. Today's acrylics are very good, so both of them have excellent aesthetics. Right? Clicking sound. Acrylics, because of the higher resiliency and the uh, that, that impact sounds are much more lesser. So you don't have any impact sounds when the patient closes mouth. You don't hear a clicking. Okay, when the patient is normally speaking or when he's closing the mouth, you don't hear that. But it's quite noisy when it comes to prostate. You can hear that clicking sound coming in very prominently when the patient is speaking or when he's just trying to close. So that's the difference between these two. So specific indications. If you're going to use acrylic teeth, what are the specific indications that you would like to look for? When you're opposing natural teeth or having metal restorations, that's number one, that you want to think about using acrylic teeth. Number two, recently extracted residual ridges. If you've had the residual ridges recently extracted, the acrylic teeth will provide some sort of cushioning because of that resiliency, thereby reducing the load coming onto the ridge per se and reducing the residual ridge resorption. Okay? Number three, if there is limited interocclusive space, if you use acrylic teeth, you can grind it whenever you need to. Grinding porcelain teeth is not easy and may compromise on the bond. Fourth, if an immediate danger is being considered, you know that there will be a lot of ridge resorption following six months of the extraction. So obviously, that you are going to have to make a lot of modifications. So it's a good idea for you to stick to acrylic teeth, at least in the initial phase. Poor ridges and mucosa. If you have poor ridges and thin mucosa, then you don't want to put the excess pressure by adding porcelain teeth. You want to stick to acrylic teeth that can absorb some of those forces and reduce the load onto the ridges. If you have aged and debilitated patients, patient is old, not well, you don't want to create discomfort, more discomfort by adding teeth that are heavier, that are going to put more pressure on the ridges. Patient will come out saying that my ridges feel very sore. See, debilitated patients usually lacking in a lot of uh, micronutrients, usually uh, have compromised health systems, and they have muscle fatigue, they have, they feel sore very quickly, and obviously dentures that are heavier, like when it becomes positive, much more heavier, dentures that are heavier are going to put a greater burden on the ridges, and the patient is going to feel much more tired eating with them. Okay? The fourth, the last one, when teeth are in contact with the retainer of an FPD. So if the teeth are coming to contact with the retainer, then you're going to have the occlusal rest in the occlusal aspect of the teeth. You understand? It's an opposing teeth. We are thinking about what teeth to select here. I have a mandibular RPD and a natural teeth with an occlusal rest there. So if this tooth, if I select porcelain, it's going to go ahead and wear out this rest completely, right? And that's going to create problems or it's going to wear out other facets of the uh, retainer's arms because the tooth is going to get worn out eventually. So this is a place where you want to select acrylic teeth so that at least they don't wear the enamel fast, thereby reducing the occlusal gingival height of the natural teeth where the clasps are holding on to, the retainers are holding on to. So if you are opposing a 
retainer in the RPD, preferably use an acrylic teeth in that position opposing it. Possibly in the advantages, insignificant wear, so for a longer period of time, patient has uh, way better vertical lamps of occlusion, it just keeps uh, the, the, the wear is very low, so the cusp heights are maintained. The polished surface maintains for years if you have not grounded, right? The master gap efficiency is very high compared to the acrylics over time, okay? Otherwise, acrylics are also pretty good. Problem, it's rarely used these days, only used when aesthetics is paramount. And here again, I sometimes see people using anterior porcelain and posterior acrylics. But the problem is when the posterior vertical dimension goes down over time because of the wear of the acrylic, you have to change everything. They cannot be trimmed and so can be used only if there is adequate intrad space. So only in cases where you have good intrad space can you use porcelain. Third, when used in combination with the opposing acrylic, it softens the impact sounds and reduces friction and chipping. Okay, but it wears down the acrylic. So one uh, school of thought is where people use upper anteriors, upper uh, dentures completely in porcelain. So the patient smiles and the aesthetics is beautiful and you get good efficiency and all that. And the mandibular ones, they tend to place acrylics. The advantage here, the clicking noise gets reduced. The efficiency is maintained for some time. But the disadvantage is that the acrylics really wear out fast when opposed with the porcelain teeth. So that means that you're going to be repeating the man, many of the mandibular dentures more. Well, you can mix and match according to what suits your patient best. If aesthetic concern is very high and you're not able to get very good aesthetics out of the acrylic teeth, then maybe you can consider using anterior uh, porcelain and going for the rest, in, uh, rest of the teeth in acrylics, which thereby reduces the uh, wear, gives a longer life and yet maintains the aesthetics in the anterior region. Well, posterior tooth forms, also I will, thought I'll just scroll down through a historical perspective. I see this uh, especially in some books and some people asking about these things. And so I'm very grateful to uh, one of the Indian books, the textbook of prosthodontics by Dr. Rangarajan and Padmanabhan. They have tried to recreate, I think, the uh, historical tooth forms. I don't find any of them on the net, so I can't get pictures of them. But I just thought I would show you in case for those of you who are watching who have never seen the particular textbook I'm talking about, please check my previous video on anterior teeth forms. In that, I'm mentioning all the textbooks I have uh, majorly taken contributions from. In that, I have given a picture also of the textbook that I took this from. Okay. Well, there are anatomic forms, modified anatomic forms, and non-anatomic forms. And let me just run through this historic perspective before we jump into the pictures and wind up. So the anatomic form was basically by Geisy, 1914, it's called True Bite. And then we had the modified anatomics and the non-anatomics. The modified anatomics, basically Geisy's cross bite teeth. Then you have channel tooth by Sears, scissor bite teeth, Pilkington Turner teeth, modified posteriors, pleasure scheme teeth, metal insert resins, cross blades and modified cross blades. And in the non-anatomic ones, we have the inverted cusp tooth by Hall, true cusp by Myerson, chopping block by Nelson, non-lock by Swenson, Swenson vitalium occlusals, uh, shear cusp tooth by Myerson again, co-masticator by Cook, cutter bar, inverted cusp tooth and linear occlusal concept by Frush. Now all of these are difficult to find these days and I can't even find pictures over the internet which is why I am very grateful to uh, those doctors for trying to develop that. So we have an idea as to how they looked over time. Okay. So I don't have pictures of all of them, but whatever was in that book, I have tried to share it with you so that you can have some idea of the how they looked like. All right? That's very interesting to see. So this is a true bite anatomic teeth by Guy C. And obviously it looks like the teeth that we use today. Uh, very much anatomic teeth. The rest of them are all non-anatomic or modified anatomic. So first of all, we look at the modified anatomics. Again, Guy C's cross bite teeth. Then you have Sears channel teeth. Here, one set of teeth has got a deep channel grooved into it and the other set has got a protrusion. So the channel helps to bite. You also have a scissor bite teeth. You have Pilkington Turner teeth, which is a modified anatomic version. Modified posteriors, metal inserts and resin teeth, right? 
uh, cross plates where the procedures are in the cross plate fashion, inverted cusp teeth, Myerson's true cusp teeth, which is a non anatomic, both of these are non anatomics, uh, Nelson's chopping block, interesting, non anatomic, Swenson's non lock teeth, again non anatomic, Hardy's posterior, vitalium with occlusal vitalium, vitalium on it. So the occlusal aspects having vitalium uh, inserts which help to bite, chew and increase the efficiency and you also have co masticate as well. These are about the pictures that I had uh, that, that was there in that book that I was able to bring. And so this is from a historical perspective you can see how people have been working at different posterior tooth forms to try to develop things that are going to be very efficient for patients that are old, especially you see a lot of non-anatomic and modified anatomics. This is primarily because patients who were coming for complete denture or removal partial denture therapy, especially complete denture therapy, were frail, were debilitated and so the occlusal scheme had to be something that does not load the ridges too much, yet provide adequate efficiency. And this was the idea behind trying to develop all sorts of different schemes, all sorts of different ideas to improve the efficiency at the same time minimizing the uh, destructive forces and minimizing the things that reduce the stability of the dentures. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and I hope that you will have a better understanding now of how to select the posterior tooth forms for your complete denture patient or your removal partial denture patient. Thank you. Have a great day.